Yo, 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 Stevie, can hey, you see boys. me? Hey, 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 hey. Can you hear me? Can you see me? How you doing? Doing good. Good to see you, my pal. I love this book. <laughs> well, thank you. This is the best rock and roll book I have read in a minute. I'm so into this book. It could have been called No Bullshit. That, that could have been the title of this book. <laughs> Oh, um, the original, that, that was the original subtitle, yes. Yeah, like, did you always uh, aspire to write a book? Or did this just happen because of quarantine? Like, how'd this happen? Hell no. No, it was way too much work uh, to aspire to. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it was, it was strictly a circumstantial, you know, the quarantine was a big part of it. Um, I got these new managers. I got managers for the first time in my life, really, and um, and they suggested it, and um, and they actually, uh, and one of the managers actually suggested uh, a beginning and an ending, you know, which I, you know, which made sense to me because uh, I, I tried it like 10, 15 years ago, and uh, I couldn't figure it out, you know, sure. um, you know, it's hard, it's not easy. To, to, to do something like this where it makes sense. And um, so he gave me a way, he gave me kind of a beginning and an ending. I thought, well, that makes sense, you know? And so, so um, you know, even though I got busy during the quarantine, uh, it was still, it was still time to do it, you know? It's fantastic. And, you know, you wrote the book like you talk, uh, which is what I love about it. And I'm from New Jersey as well. And we have a certain uh, kind of, uh, you know, we let it rip. <laughs> and uh, you pulled no punches in this book, which I really appreciated. Um, you know, uh, you call yourself at one point, you're very self-deprecating, half a moron. You said, I'm half a moron. I should never be writing a book. But... <laughs> You've done a fantastic job like you have at so many other things. Uh, do you feel like, do you have a confidence in you uh, that you think in some ways comes from New Jersey or, 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 or something that pushes you forward and says, yes, I can do this shit? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I, I think that stuff comes from um, very, very young. You know, I, I think... Uh, you know, if we get all the love we need and support we need, I mean, young, you know, like, I don't know, five years old, you know. Um, and I grew up, even though, even though my mother uh, got divorced quite young, uh, when, I, when I was quite young, um, I was, I think, around two or three, um, we moved in with her, you know, with her, with her parents, you know, with, with my grandparents. And there were three or four, you know, uncles and aunts around. And, uh, you know, it was really like an Italian village, you know, that I grew up in. Sure. And so, you know, being the first grandson, you know, an Italian family, you know, uh, it's, it's royalty, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, I think that was, I think that's where that, that stuff comes from, honestly. It, it comes very early. It's the same reason why, you know, I, I always enjoyed being more behind the scenes, you know. I never really wanted to be a front guy. You know, I got, I got quite good at it in the 80s, you know, when, when, I had, when I had to do it, you know. But it was never my natural inclination to do that. You know, I just, I just, I didn't like the, you know, I didn't like the spotlight. I don't really like that much attention, to be honest, you know. I like, uh, like being off to the side a little bit, you know, behind a guy or, 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 you know. I like to be able to go out, you know. And sit in a cafe and, and and write and observe and you know live live life you know and sure. uh, you know I don't really like I don't like the I don't like the life of a celebrity you know I really I really don't you know I, I only had one one little taste of it um, really um, from my, as far as my own career um, I had I had uh, on my third album I had two two hit singles in Italy yeah and uh, and my wife comes over you know. You know, we're gonna just you know go go shopping or go to a cafe or something, and I couldn't walk down the street. Is this the you know? Revolution record or? No, this would have been Freedom No Compromise. Yeah, all right. uh, uh, Bitter Fruit and No More Parties were both hit singles in that in that one country. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I swear to God, could not walk down the street. Hundreds of kids, you know, autographed pictures, you know, 
And I'm thinking, geez, you know, I should be excited about this. You know, I should, I should be enjoying this, you know? I mean, it's a very rare example of, 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 of any kind of commercial success that I've ever had, you know? You know, other than with Bruce or with Sopranos or whatever, but yeah. as far as my own work, you know, I never have really found that common ground with an audience, you know? So here I am finally finding some common ground with an audience. And I got to tell you the truth, I, I didn't like it. I really didn't like it, you know? I didn't like that experience of uh, you can't walk down the street, you know? Sure. I'm like, man, that's, that's, you know. And so, you know, who knows, who knows why we are, who we are, you know, but, but I think it comes from that. It comes from kind of being secure, you know? Like I say, you got, you got enough love as a kid where that just stays with you, some kind of some kind of weird security and confidence. Sure. You know? I mean, you talk in the book, one of the themes of the book is you talk about, you know, how you're a natural born consigliere, okay? And something that really struck me early in the book, you know, you talked about how Bruce was shy and in some ways you had to um, push him a little bit to embrace being a lead singer and uh, being a star. And then later you talk similarly about Jimmy Gandolfini, how uh, he wanted to quit, you know, the Sopranos multiple times. And you would talk to him and say, get the fuck out there and be the great actor that you are. What do these guys not have that you are able to give them in these situations? Well, I mean, you know, it's easy, it's easy to give advice, you know, from the bleachers, you know what I mean? If you're not on the field, it's kind of, you know, it's easier, man, you know, to, to what, what, you know, what I, what I have is perspective. You know, I, I can see very clearly what's going on. You know, it's always easy to see somebody else's life. I can't see my own, you know, I mean, one of the reasons why I wrote the book was I was hoping it would explain my fucking life to me, you know, <laughs> all right, yeah. you know, but but uh, but but you know you can really see clearly when it comes to other people, and if you care about them, you know I tend to um, rise to that occasion. You know what I mean? I, I I give very good advice when I when I when it's important, you know. And um, and with, with with Bruce, it was it was just kind of obvious. Uh, I just felt um, you know we should start using his own name. Uh, I don't know, you know. Uh, uh, but with Jimmy, um, he just was, I think one of the reasons why we bonded was, was he was a natural character actor, you mm -hmm. know, he wasn't a, you know, a natural lead guy, you know, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and I understand that very well, you know, I'm the same way. And, and so, you know, it was just a matter of, of, uh, logic, uh, you know, saying to him, look, you know, cause he, he didn't, he didn't know how good he was really, you know? I mean, he's one of the greatest actors of all time, as far as right. I'm concerned. You know, and I, I don't think I don't think you ever you ever can really evaluate yourself that way. You know, sure. um, but but he but he um, he was just shocked by the physical challenge of going from two pages a day in movies to seven pages a day with TV. You know, sure. I mean, which is believe me, when you're trying to memorize something, you know. Uh, tr you know, try it. Try try and memorize a, a paragraph in a book. You know, you know, and then and then try and memorize four pages. <laughs> you know, uh, believe me, it's a challenge. And and uh, at first he was like, no, no way, I can't do this. I can't, I can't keep doing this. Especially you know, in America, you know, we work, you know, from six a.m. to ten p.m. You know, you go home and you and you got to memorize the seven pages for tomorrow. You know, sure. you know, I mean, it was very different when I got to Norway and did Lillehammer, believe me, you know, they, they like, they believe in quality of life, man. Yeah. You know, don't call them after five o'clock. Right. Because they, they are not answering the phone. That's <laughs> and it. On weekend, forget about weekends. And when they go on vacation, they don't give a fuck if the whole world is fucking crumbling. All right. You know, they, they're, they're very strictly nine to five, you know, I mean, I, I, I'd be, I'd be home. I'm like, damn. I can have dinner. I can have a meeting. You know, I can live. A, I can live my life over here. You know, sure. um, shocking. It was shocking. Of course, 
Have you as been the act, tempted? As, as, the act, as the actor, I was thrilled. As the producer, I was I was like, we're not getting anything done, you know. <laughs> Come on. Let, me, uh, let me take you back because I want to. You you talk so much about the musical process, both producing, arranging, uh, writing songs. You really we get a peek under the hood at how you do shit. Uh, I want to go back to the beginning. I had to, I have interviewed so many people on my show uh, who I admire. Dion, Darlene Love, Nils Lofgren. Last oh. month I had Frankie Valli. Uh, yeah. And uh, he told me that you guys went in the New Jersey Hall of Fame together. Isn't that right? That's right. Yeah. 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 And he was, uh, he was one of my sopranos uh, compadres also. He, he still sounds great, by the way. You know, he he's he sent us his new record and I don't know how he does it. He still has that high register. <laughs> I love him. I mean, he's, he's so important to my generation. I'll oh, forget it. You know, he was just one of the greatest when and those some of the greatest records ever made. You know, unbelievable. I, now, I've also interviewed Jerry Gross from the Dobells. OK, wow. And he lives. I live in Philly. He lives in Cherry Hill over here. And, um, you know, on camera, he gave me these stories. And then off camera, he gave me all these salacious stories. And <laughs> those salacious stories were verified by your book. OK. <laughs> yeah, I hope I don't get anybody in trouble. <laughs> but it's, you know, it is uh, whatever, 50 years later. So, you know, like, like how did that come about? How did you get wrapped up with the Dovells who at that point were I guess maybe 10 years out from a hit at that point. Yeah. 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 And that was, that was, that was the tragedy of that generation. They got put out to pasture by the you know, British invasion. The, the British invasion put all their heroes out of work. It was completely ironic. Um, yeah. I, well, the, the, you know, my life is just full of weird circumstances and uh, this was one of them. Um, I quit after, you know, they were gonna do the E Street Band thing without me. You know, I I just I said eh, that's enough. I quit. I quit. You know, I, I thought we had I, I, I thought we had missed the boat anyway. You know? Huh? They didn't want two guitars. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It was just an, an extra expense. You know, you know, uh, and and you know and uh, and and so I and I I really felt that we had missed the boat anyway. I mean, I felt like everything great had already been done. You know, <laughs> it wasn't that wrong, but, but anyway, uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, so, so, uh, I quit and I'm working construction for two years and I play a football on a weekend flag football and I broke my finger still bent. Oh shit. Yeah. And I, and I got on the field surgery, you know, dislocated, dislocated it, you know, so they pulled it back in, you know. And uh, so to exercise the finger, uh, I, I couldn't work anymore because I was working a jackhammer, you know, which is, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't pick one up now. Um, uh, uh, you know, to, I couldn't work anymore. So, so uh, I thought, well, to exercise my finger, I'll join a band and play piano. Cause like, you know, I could play piano chords, you know. I'm not really a piano player, but, you know. So I joined uh one of the groups uh the remnants of what had been one of the great groups of our of our area a group called the mods mm -hmm. and um the mods you know with, with the two lily brothers and and one of the lily brothers started this new group and um so i'm not sure i think they had asked me to join the mods at one point so i knew him from that anyway i ended up joining the band and uh and a cousin uh, of the drummer, <laughs> this is how my life works. The, the drummer's cousin ended up being one of the Dovells. <laughs> and they, I guess their band either quit or, or they fired their band for some reason and they needed a, a new band really quick. So um, we, uh, I, guess, I guess, I don't know, half of that band or whatever it was, Couple of those guys ended up becoming the Dovell's band on the on the road, sure. which I was excited about because in those days I was a gambler, and and, and one of the things that they were going to be doing was playing Las Vegas. Okay, and that was that was exciting to me. Okay, you know, 
But along the way, I played what they call the oldie circuit for a year. It's something that I didn't know existed. And even now, uh, you wouldn't even know it existed. It's one of those things. It's like an underground sort of thing. So when you say oldies circuit, in that era, oldies was only like songs that were like 10 years old or even, even right. sooner than that. Like music from, right. would you say, before the British invasion is oldies? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, and, and, um, and, and tragically, they were all put out the pasture. It's the only generation, the pioneers of the 50s and early 60s were the only generation that were frozen in time. Sure. Everybody after that, the audience evolved with them. And, you know, who were the biggest bands uh, in 1964? The Beatles and the Stones. Who's the biggest bands now? <laughs> the Beatles and Stones. You sure. know, McCartney, and, right? You know, I mean, you know, so, so every generation after that grew with the bands, you know, except for that one, you know, which is ironic since they invented it, right? Sure. And um, and so I'm I'm on this I'm on that circuit which is, you know, hotels and uh, I guess it probably would involve cruise ships although I never did one of those because I'm I, I would never do one of those, uh, um, um, you know, uh, uh, Vegas and but also uh, arenas. It's the first time I played Madison Square Garden was was like uh, on a package show like a package yeah. show. Yeah. 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 I mean, like 10, 12, 15 x Yeah. Yeah. So you played MSG with the Dovells. Is this what you're saying? Yes. Wow. Yes. Yes. And and, and more importantly, I, I, I heard Little Richard do a sound check that was uh, incredible. I was going to ask you, I have this on my piano. Listen, mm -hmm. uh, I worship Little Richard. I think he's the greatest, uh, you know, rock and roll entertainer ever. He's like 10,000 firecrackers going off at one time. But people don't talk enough about what a great singer he was. It's always about, you know, the, the explosion, his, him as a performer, right? But yeah. there's something yeah. about Richard with his voice, which I feel like Otis Redding, you know, really learned a lot about singing from, from Little Richard. And oh, you, yeah. You talk about seeing this sound check with Little Richard, and it gave me chills. Tell me about that moment. Yeah, and you know, and partially what you're saying is true because of Richard himself. You know, who already by then, by by 1973, you know, he'd sing half a song, and then he's jumping up on the piano and taking his shirt off. You know, you know, it, it was completely jive at that point uh, because they were they were all deep down, really pissed off, yeah. really pissed off. And so all of that, all of that oldie circuit was revenge for them. Sure. <laughs> you know, any way they can get in any way they can, like, you know, it was, there, you know, anyway, um, he happened to be in a singing mood. And, you you know, if you go back and listen to his gospel records, you can you can get a flavor Ooh. of it. But, but, but uh, he just was in a singing mood that day and, and did uh, like a whole show uh you know hmm. gospel country blues rolling stone songs uh you know and i mean sang his ass off hmm. I, I mean just an incredible singer um and he obviously did influence otis and james brown and everybody else sure. um, but but you wouldn't know it from you know you wouldn't really know it although it's although he's singing great on his on his hit records too you know but but uh but he's but he's much more uh, he's actually much more versatile than that and, and uh, just a, just one of the, one of the greatest singers of all time. So you're you're sitting there with the Dovells in Vegas. Is this what you're doing like this? <laughs> like that's your job? <laughs> yeah, they they had made uh, two of my favorite records. You know. Um, uh, Bristol Stomp and You Can't Sit Down, which I think are two of the greatest records. And uh, oh yeah, yeah, two two of my two of my favorites. You know. Well, you know, you and I have a mutual friend in Jerry Blavitt, the Geeter with the Heater. I lost your mic here a little bit. Oh, you did. What happened? You 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 you're suddenly you got no volume. Hold on one second. Something happened when you when you turn around and play the piano. Something happened. Oh okay. I 
played the piano and the volume dropped. Oh, uh, there, no, now it's fine. Now it's fine. All right. I fucked it up by playing music. God damn. <laughs> I didn't know I wasn't allowed to play fucking music. Um, it just came back. It just came back. It came back. All right. Um, you know, uh, you and I have a mutual friend in Jerry Blavitt, the Geeter with the Heater. Yeah. Yeah. And he still yeah, plays right. the Dovells and, you know, Hank Ballard and James, er, the early James Brown and all this music. And he says something to me that you said in your book, which is that Vegas died. Vegas died, it, you know, in the early 70s. And you had to be there. You had to see what it was like beforehand. Tell me what it was like, and did that vision of Vegas and organized crime at that time influence Silvio Dante at all? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I don't know about that directly, but but um, uh, when the mob ran Vegas, it was a lot more fun, you know, and 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 a lot better, and uh, you know, the concept in those days was make all the money from gambling. And uh, so the rooms were nothing. The buffets were nothing, you know, 275 all you could eat. And the rooms were like, you know, $18. <laughs> um, you know, um, th their whole thing, the whole concept of Vegas was lure people there and then, and then get them gambling, you know? And, and, you know, it's just, you know, when you think about it, you realize the financial, the real financial story, because you know there they are. They're they're probably skimming God knows what twenty five percent, you know, third off the top, uh, on top of of not making any money from food or rooms. The lounge the lounge was six dollars, and Frank Sinatra could walk in. Sure, you know. So there they are skimming off the top a third and making no money from anything else. And everybody still got rich, <laughs> you know, Yeah. which gives you, you know, some inclination as to, you know, the corporations looked at this and they were like, you know, well, leaving a lot of money on the table, you know, but it, you know what I mean, so to speak. It's like there was more of a scene, you know, like. Yeah, but it was, but it was more relaxed because, you know, you come out of the Flamingo and Caesars was way over there. It was like a diagonal, I don't know, 300 yards away across the street and nothing in between. Sure. You know, uh, now you can literally walk from, you know, uptown to downtown on top of the rooftops, you know? So, so it wasn't, it wasn't super packed. It was only the uh, classic uh, eight or so big hotels and then the classic six or eight downtown, you know? And uh, it was all working very, very well, really. Uh, it's a shame that it changed. But anyway, um, you know, I, I had been studying uh, the mob stuff my whole life, just, just as, a, as a hobby, as a, you know, as an interest. I don't know why, you know, I just, I like that whole, I like that whole thing. And I read every book and saw every movie and, um, you know, I just felt I could do it. I felt like, you know, and you'd, you'd run into some of those guys, you know, whether they were the real thing or whether they were wannabes, uh, didn't matter. They were equally scary, you know. Really, so you know. So you know, you 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 know, you 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 you'd see it. You know, it was around in Jersey, and and you certainly saw it in Vegas. You know, a lot of the, you know. Every every single dealer seemed to be from Cleveland. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so I want to ask you, Stevie. Look, like. You're spending your time in casino. You're playing in casinos. You're playing in in hotel lounges. Uh, you know, after this, in the early East Street days, you're playing in uh, you know seaside bars. And this generation, this current generation, we don't have that same culture of bands. You know, go out every weekend and just see whatever's on at the club. Like we don't have that. Right. So take me back for like one second. What do you feel uh, is the most valuable thing from having that, you know, that that club circuit feeding up into the music business 
that we're missing now? Well, you know, it, it wasn't feeding much up. I mean, it was it was related, but uh, a hundredth of one percent, you know, would feed its way up. But but um, the difference was the quality of life. You know, the the music was in the air all the time. You know, AM radio was great before FM radio started. Sure. In the late sixties, you know. Um, the bands, you know, um, when we were situated, you know, in between Philly and New York, so all the bands would stop in, in, in uh, Asbury Park, you know, on their way to New York. So we got a chance to see all the big bands, you know. Um, but locally, uh, it's all you did. I mean, you know, you might occasionally go to a movie, you know, drive-ins were big back then, you know, but that's, I don't know, once a week. Any other, you know, the other couple nights of the week you went out, you know, you go, you either were playing or you're going to see a band. That was it. That was that was the world that we knew. Um, not just musicians either. I mean, everybody. Sure. And it was because of, because of the Beatles. The Beatles, the Beatles, and and the and the rest of the British invasion had such an impact on our culture that it became the thing. You know, bands became the thing. Okay, and they didn't exist before that. Didn't right. exist. You know, you go to your high school dance, it was an instrumental group, you know, um, guy with a saxophone, you know, and, uh, you know, they're playing, you know, ventures songs or whatever, you know what I mean? There was no, there was no such thing as a band that sang and played. Sure. You didn't see it, you know, uh, you know, like I say in a book, you know, you, you had <laughs> as kids, you know, we, we didn't we didn't really relate to the Beach Boys because because they were like fraternity guys in college, Preppy. you know, and, you know, the Four Seasons all, all look like your Italian uncles, you know, so so, <laughs> so you know, those two who, who were legitimate groups at the time, they, we they were kind of discounted, you know, in, in, a, in a way, you know, we love the records, but you know, they weren't really that relatable, you know, for, for, as kids, you know, when here comes the British invasion, boom total relatability and uh, an entirely new uh, idea uh, for, for, for kids to, to enjoy. And, and that's all you did. That's all you did was go out and see bands or you went out and you played one or the other. You know? is, is, as a musician on that scene, as a performer on that scene, are you and all your uh, compatriots all thinking, oh, let's try to get signed let's try to get famous or do you feel like this could be all we do and this is this is okay at this level yeah yeah no no you didn't think that you didn't think that far ahead uh, oh, 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 that that's what separated bruce really from most of my friends uh he was thinking that way you know he he was always thinking way ahead and and uh and seriously about the business uh, most everybody else was just like, uh, you know, can we, can we make a living doing this locally, you know, which was, uh, doable, you know, not easy, but, but doable. And, uh, we struggled with that because, um, you really had to be a top 40 band as, as it was known sure. to work, to work in the bars. I mean, that was just not an option, you know? So once you got above the teenage stuff, the teenage clubs and like, you know, the, uh, well, there were teenage nightclubs and like the Latin de Vu, uh, and the beach clubs and the high school dances, you know, once you got to that next level of bars, now things became real. And so you didn't have, you didn't have that freedom anymore. You had, you had, complete, you had complete freedom as a teenager, you know, the, in, in, with your teenage band, you could do whatever you wanted, you know? Uh, you know, but but once you got to the bar level, it had to be the top forty period. And uh, at, at, by the time we got there, which was the seventies, the top forty was no longer interesting. You know, yeah. so, so so we, um, as opposed to the sixties, when in my mind it was the highest evolution of our art form that sure. there would ever be. You know, that there would ever be. You know, was the sixties pop music. You sure. know, I am. Uh, uh... I interviewed most of Sly and the Family Stone on this show. I, I couldn't interview. Nobody gets to talk to Sly, but I got to speak to uh, Larry Graham and Gregorico and all those guys 
And they themselves said, you know, we were kind of the peak of the, of the mountain uh, in terms of, of this culture around the music. Um, was, was Sly and the Family Stone, you know, big for you? Did you listen to their records? They were very big for me um, back then. And uh, I'd, I'd say even bigger now. And really, that's what I modeled my Disciples of Soul Absolutely. on these previous three years, you know, the 17, 18, 19, uh, when I had the most productive three years of my life. Um, you know, I was really completely, Summer of Sorcery in particular. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, that communion song that opens up the record. Communion, great song. And it reminded me of Sly, that's why I asked. Yeah. Good, good, yeah, and and you know, an open. It was a show opener. I need, I needed the writer. I needed the writer show opener, and uh, and and um, I wanted to continue what they were doing, you know, uh, which was incredible, absolutely incredible. I mean, a combination of various you know genres of music, along with the racial combination and the gender combination. I mean, you know, they they were in many ways the ultimate. Uh, and you know, then, you know, and it was audaciously positive music, um, which is yeah. something I respond to in what you do. You you are audaciously positive. You know, um, I saw the Disciples of Soul uh, when you were in Philly uh, on the Soul Fire tour, and yeah. I said, "God damn, it's it's so rare that we see anything anymore that's uplifting, that's positive. Everything mm. is so cynical. Um, is that intentional?" during a time when people are feeling very cynical these days that you you try to write that way yeah um yeah i think that's always been there even when i was at my most at my most political um uh i always try to try to leave it you know in a positive way for the most part uh have some positive energy you know being communicated uh almost always you know I mean, when I'm telling stories that are not so pleasant, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, Los Desaparecidos or, 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 or Bitter Fruit or, or uh, you know, uh, you know, I always, even, even then you try, you try to interject a little bit of, you know, positive hope, a little bit of hope, you know, into the, into the mix, you know, because, you know, you don't want to go around whining and complaining about the world, you know. What I mean, what, what good is that? What was that gonna? What was that gonna get you? You know. So you want to, you want to, you know. I, I look, every artist I feel should ask themselves what I ask myself all the time, which is, how can you be useful? You know, how can sure. you be useful? You know, I mean, you got you got your work to do. You got certain things you got to do, but at some point, you really got to ask yourself, how can I be useful? And um, I try to make my work useful. Oh, I mean, you are what I would call a uh, fire starter uh, type. Everything you get involved with, whether it's radio, television, streaming, record labels, you know, you, you make shit happen. And, and uh, one of the things that you did that I got to take you back to something is your Underground Garage Festival. I was there. I was just right. coming out of school and I was just starting my own first bands, okay? And I was like, list, starting to listen to the Underground Garage. And when I heard that Iggy and the Stooges were gonna be on this thing and the New York Dolls were gonna be on this thing, I said, I, whatever else, I'm there. <laughs> now, in the book, you talk about how you lost a lot of money on that. And it was, you know, it was raining, the stage broke. It was a pain in the ass. But listen, Stevie, that was a seminal day for me. I got to see Iggy Pop with the Stooges. I got to see David Johansson sing New York Dolls songs for the first time in fucking forever. I got to see Bo Diddley. I got to see Big Star. And mm. it was also the peak of the Sopranos. So you a lot of your, your, your Sopranos pals were there. I remember Tony Sirico, I think, came out and he said, this music is all trash. Where's Frank Sinatra? <laughs> yeah well i had a, i had a very expensive uh, uh you know rotating stage made you know 
because I wanted it to be, you know, like the old days, you know, the uh, the old Alan Freed shows or Murray Decay, and, you know, and, uh, you know, the, the early bands would, you know, 15, 20 minutes each. And then the, the stage would turn and the next one would, you know, start right away. Well, you know, the stage broke around th three groups in. So I, <laughs> so I had I, I had to, you know, I had to draft all my friends to be MCs in between because now I got like, you know, 50 bands, whatever it was, you know, and I need I needed an MC in between everyone, you know, now to introduce them. So, you know, I was I was I was uh, I grabbed everybody who was around, you know, Tony Cerebro, but, uh, watching him watch bands like the distillers and the dictators that was entertainment in and of itself by the way <laughs> yeah well yeah we we, we we had nancy sinatra there for him so absolutely listen but anyway thank you for putting that festival together yeah. i don't know if you got to see summer of soul but will we ever get to see that footage will we ever get that. to see that shit um, well, it, the footage disappeared, you know, and um, we're going through all the storage lockers trying to find it. So we'll see. Maybe we'll stumble upon it. But uh, it would have been the first 3D. You know, 3D had gone way out of style decades earlier. There had been there had been no 3D movies at all, you know. So I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the only the first 3D concert, you know. Any special 3D cameras there and. Uh, and all that footage disappeared. So I hope you find it because you know it was seminal. That Iggy performance was an all-time performance. I mean, I'll never yeah. forget it. I will never forget it. So thank you for that. Uh, speaking of legends, uh, I'm looking at your website and everybody that has read this book and recommended this book, and a little guy named Bob Dylan. Uh, <laughs> you know. You are just that guy. Every time there's great things happening in the music world, you're you're just there somehow. And uh, your friendship with Bob Dylan is fascinating to me because there's very few people that allow us to get a window into him. Um, and his quote about your book is hilarious. <laughs> it's hilarious. Tell me about he's, your friendship with with Bob. Well, he's got first of all, he, he has quite a really great sense of humor, which uh, I'm not sure people really know. I, I guess if they saw, you know, if they saw the Rolling Thunder, uh, oh, yeah. the, the latest, you know, Scorsese Rolling Thunder thing, they got some idea of his sense of humor, I guess. But uh, I mean, he was, you know, he, he was doing humor right from the first album on, really. Oh, yeah. um, so I, I, you know, I talk about our, our encounters in, in the book, you know, it, it's always an interesting encounter with Bob, you know, and um, I'm just grateful that he's a, that he's an acquaintance, you know, I mean, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't use, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so, you know, so arrogant as to use the word friend, you know, but, but, but um, we're certainly very friendly and, uh, you know, I just, I just love him and, uh, you know, every time we 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 have an encounter, it's 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 <laughs> it's historic, and I, and I and I I detail them all in the book. Yes. Uh, you know, this you know it's this always a trip, and it's always interesting. And uh, you know, what can I say uh, other than um, you know we 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 only see each other every, you know once or twice a year, if that, if that you know and. Uh, Sure. Just always, you know, he's just always, uh, I don't know, we just like each other, you know, for whatever, you know, why does anybody like anybody, right? Who knows, you know, you just get along. You know? Stevie, I get chills uh, when you write about Paul McCartney coming on stage with you. Um, yeah. Not only that, Ray Davies is an audience, you know, Ray Davies, who I consider, you know, one of the top five rock and roll songwriters ever. Hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, I did, did a nice night. Long, Tell me about that uh, night. Yeah, I, I uh, you know, it was just one of those uh, rare moments when, um, you know, I, I had flown in just from uh, my other, my other sort of, uh, you know, bucket list uh, accomplishment of being in a Marty Scorsese movie 
you know, uh, the night before, uh, did a little cameo in the Irishman, and and, and then Jerry I Vail. went, huh? You were Jerry Vale. Yeah, 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 yeah. It would have been, you know, Jerry. Jerry left us, you know, and allowed me to uh, do that. Uh, or else it would have been Jerry himself. Um, anyway, I get I get to the sound check late in London. We're starting we starting the English tour. I get there late because I'm, I'm just I'm just flying in and uh, I'm half delirious anyway. And it's like I, I walk in and, and and the sound check is pretty much over. And I get a phone call. Paul Paul McCartney might be coming to the show tonight. I'm like, oh my goodness, you know. What if he wants to do something? You know, we gotta we gotta prepare something. So I I, I had him hold the doors. And it was like, I think it was raining out, I think, because it was like 3,000 people were trying to get in. And um, I just said, you know, let's, let's, let's do a, I know, I know Paul's a fan of Little Richard, you know, because if it wasn't for Paul, I never would have heard of Little Richard, you know, hmm. uh, and, you know, and the Beatles. Uh, uh, so I said, let's, let's do a Little Richard uh, version of I Saw Her Standing There. Um, and uh, I just, you know, put basically a, a little Richard Horn line uh, on there. And, and real quick, uh, we, ran, we ran to it one time. And, uh, and then sure enough, he shows up. And, uh, and, he, and he had, you know, he's been touring now constantly at that point. You know, he just was like, he, you know, him and Bob Dylan both, they don't, you know, they just, they're on the road all the time. So I was, I thought it was very unusual for him to go out and socialize, you know, um, and it was a great wife, Nancy. And uh, so I said, Paul, you know, I really appreciate you coming. Don't feel any obligation to come on stage. Just relax. And I tell you, you're going to love this band. I, got, I put together one of the greatest bands in history. You're going to love this band. And uh, just you and Nancy sit with Maureen and, and, and just, you know, enjoy yourself. Don't just totally relax, you know? And so that was that. And uh, and when, you know, I'm taking a bow for the encore, my roadie comes up, he's coming on. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh man, I hope you remember the song that we just rehearsed once. And, and, and but, that, but you know, what kind of balls does it take for him to do that, right? He doesn't know what, what I'm gonna do. He had no idea, right? Uh, no, no rehearsal. You know, uh, I mean, it was an incredibly ballsy and, and, and just a real blind faith, showed a lot of blind yes. faith in me, you, you know what I mean? Your band, and you and your band. Yeah, I mean, you know, so it, it really was such a, such a magical moment of my life, you know, that, that the endorsement of him coming on my stage, you know? Yes, he came up with the E Street Band, which was great. And he had me and Bruce play with him at, at the garden which was nice, you know, all that is great. But coming on my stage, you know, that's something different, that's different. And uh, it was it was uh, one of the great moments of my life, uh, without a doubt. And uh, my, my poor, <laughs> my poor uh, camera guy, you know, Ryan Shelley's out there trying to document the tour. You know, he's got, he's got two cameras. He's got you know, you know, his camera and another guy, you know, there was no big formality, you know, we're going to document the tour. I just said, hey, let's just do it, you know, for social media purposes. And, you know, maybe we can get a video out of it now and then, you know. So there he is. There's going to be the one performance by Paul McCartney. <laughs> He's got to get it right, you know, with two cameras. <laughs> uh, the poor guy. And he did a good job. He did a good job. You know. I mean, it was, it was one, you know, one of the great moments of my life, without a doubt, as was working with Scorsese 24 hours earlier, you know, uh, again, one of the great moments of my life. I just I love Scorsese so much and uh, respect him so much. And I run into him and I run into him every couple of years, just like I run into Bob Dylan and, uh, you know, finally got a chance to work together for, for just, you know, you know, I'm on the screen for about four seconds, but yeah, it's but okay. But it's, enough. <laughs> it's a beautiful scene because if you for anybody that's watching has seen the Irishman, everybody's seen the Irishman. You know, we get Bobby De Niro, Al Pacino, Harvey Keitel, and Joe Pesci 
on screen together in one room, okay, in a film directed by who I consider the greatest director of the last 50 years. Um, and you're in that scene, it was, it's just, um, it was real emotional for people, I think, to watch that, certain, certainly for me. Yeah, me too, me too. Amazing, I mean, great things are happening for you. So many people of your generation, so many artists, they kind of go on default settings uh, later in their career. And I feel like you put the gas pedal down in the 21st century. What, what yeah, no, for you? Like, yeah. why is it all, you know, I feel like you're blossoming in your career now. Why? I, you know, I'm telling you that my life, you know, and, and again, one of the reasons for writing the book was hoping that it would explain it to me because I don't really, you know, I, I don't really plan these things. And the, the things I plan usually don't work, you know? Uh, so this was completely circumstantial once again. Like, like most of my life's most important moments. You know, a guy simply, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in London, summer of 16. This crazy uh, promoter, Leo Green, uh, says, well, you know, when are you coming back to London? I said, well, me and Maureen come back every year for a birthday, you know. But this year we're coming a little earlier because Bill Wyman invited us to his 80th birthday party. And, uh, you know, Bill Wyman, you know, the original bass player with the Rolling Stones and one of the great bass players of all time and, and underrated bass players of all time, uh, a big part of their sound, actually. If anybody ever gets a chance to see Charlie is My Darling in a movie theater, don't hesitate to see that. It's one of the most incredible things you ever, you'll ever see in your life, or or hear. Uh, the the Stones in '65, forget ah. it. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so uh, he says uh, you come back to Bill Wyman's birthday party. That's the same week as my blues festival. Why don't you just throw a band together and, play, and headline one of the nights? You know. And I was like, whoa. I said, well, I haven't fronted a band in, uh, let's see, one, two, three, 30 years. <laughs> uh, you know, but I thought about it and I thought, you know what, it, it actually could be fun because I'll, I'll, I'll bring back the horns. I'll do some Paul Butterfield songs with the horns, which nobody has ever heard. I'll do electric flag songs with the horns that nobody's ever heard live, you know, you know, two people who at Monterey, you know, heard them. You know, because they lasted about 10 minutes. Um, I'll do some blues things, you know, and I thought I'll do one of my favorite black exploitation songs. It's James Brown. You know, I came up with a riff for the middle. So I said, this, this way I get a little bit more jazz into the, into the mix and uh, let the horn players blow a little bit, you know. And then I'll throw in some of my old songs, <laughs> which I haven't even listened to in 30 years, you know. Great songs. And I, and I start playing these songs and I'm like, damn, <laughs> you know, these things are interesting, you know, just from a distance, you know, from a perspective of like, you know, I'm like, there's something interesting about these songs, you know, they're, 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 they're just kind of their own unique kind of genre in a way. And uh, anyway, so Mark Ribbler, I, I, I got Mark Ribbler from, from, you know, he had, been, I had, I had, I drafted him, I grabbed him to be Darlene Love's music director. Because I not only produced her, the album introducing Darlene Love, I reproduced her live show. Yeah. You know, and I produced a Christmas show for her too. You know, I wanted to really, you know, I wanted her to come back and really, you know, knock people out, which of course she does. Oh, I mean, uh, for those that haven't seen Darlene Love live, at age 80, she sounds better than everybody i mean yeah. i asked her on this show what is your secret what is it you know <laughs> i mean she looks and sounds fantastic and you had a big role big role in putting her where she deserves to be so thank you for that no it was my my honor my pleasure um anyway so i i called darlene i said darlene i, I gotta borrow mark back i'm just gonna do this one gig you know in england and it just felt so good, uh, you know, uh, you know, and, and 
and, and, and Bruce decides he's going to do this thing on Broadway. And I don't have a new TV show. I had I had them taking it. I, I, I got five scripts, 25 treatments. And I'm kind of like, everybody's like, yeah, 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 but nothing's happening. So I'm like, uh, well, well, let's let's make a record. What the hell? Uh, but I'm not ready to write a whole new album. I haven't written an album for myself in 30 years. Um, let's do songs I've written for other people. So we do Soul Fire. Uh, run into a guy who wants to hear it live and bankrolls the tour. And, uh, and on that, you know, and on that tour, uh, I start getting some ideas for, for a new album, you know, and, and uh, the Summer of Sorcery gets born. So all of that, no plans of coming back into the business, no plans on getting back into the music business, uh, no plans on getting the Disciples of Soul back out, none of that, none of that, you know, and, uh, and uh, again, just, just a bizarre circumstance of some guy in England saying, hey, throw a beer together and, and play my blues festival. I mean, it, that's it, my life. That's it, my I life. I guess the moral of the story is don't plan, just do. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, I think, I think while you're busy planning things, you know, it, it's good to be busy, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You don't, want, you don't <laughs> want to be waiting around, okay? That, that's one thing I don't do very well is wait. <laughs> So, you know, you don't want to be waiting around for that phone to ring. That's the last thing you want to do. Just be busy doing something over here and then something will come in over there. You know, that's just, that's just how it works. Yeah. Stevie, this is a great book. Let's get it on the bestseller list, okay? You, yeah, you've well. done it all. You you know, film, television. You created a brand new radio format, okay, that supports bands you actually like, like mine. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Uh, but above all, before you go, my last question, you, there's a beautiful moment in this book where you talk about being on stage with Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, who I consider the greatest American live band. Um, and you talk about how after 50 years, you know, when you're on stage together and it's cold or it's raining or the, the sound goes out, or something fucked up happened in the news that day, or somebody died. You know, uh, when Bruce looks over, he wants to see you. He wants to see you there. And this, there's this relationship that all of us as fans are invested in. What is it like, Stevie, at this point, 50 years when you could be sitting on the couch to get on stage or get in a studio with Bruce Springsteen and all those guys and girls uh, at another time in life, what, what's it like now? Well, it's it's better it's better than ever because um, you know you you don't you don't have the uh, anxieties you know when, that you have when you're young. Uh, at this point, you know you tend to appreciate things uh, a little bit better, and uh, you don't have that many friends. Uh, you know, they've been friends for that long, you know? Uh, so you cherish that and, and you really do, uh, you know, you're grateful for that. Uh, and it gives you, uh, it gives you a certain uh, consistency, you know, a certain, uh, you know, a certain, a certain kind of security in a way or consistency that no matter how crazy the world gets, you know, there's certain things that are still, you can depend on, you know? Yeah. And that's, you know, friendship, you know, sometimes it's family and sometimes it's your work, you know. Uh, we were lucky, we're, you know, we're the luckiest generation, without a doubt. And we're luckier than most because um, we were one of the last bands in the door, you know. Yeah. You know, I mean, OK, you know, the couple have been a after us, of course, you know. But at that <laughs> level, at that level. In yeah in a sustained way that 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 iconic stadium level it doesn't happen in the same way today yeah and i think we were you know a little bit older than we should have been you know and we, we got we got famous later than you know probably older than most bands which i think helps you also also um appreciate it you yeah. know what i mean if you're, if you're you know if you're 16 18 years old and you're a superstar you know you're gonna have problems you know 
uh, because it's, it's it, you, you have no perspective on it. You have no context, but you know, if you don't, you don't have a hit till you're 30 years old, which was the case with us. Yeah. You know, it's different. And, and you, so you're right, right away. You, you are, are appreciating it, uh, you know, and, and, uh, you know how to handle it. You can handle it a little bit better than, than, you know, so anyway, it comes down to, um, comes down to, uh, you know, that's the place I feel most comfortable really is, is on stage with the E Street Band. That's, that's, you know, people think that's going to work. Uh, you, you know, you go to work when you walk off the stage. That's, that's when the work begins, yeah. you know? <laughs> uh, so that's always been, you know, I don't feel any different than when I went on stage at 15, 16, 18, 25, 35, you know, yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? You walk on stage and, 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 and uh, you know, I have a theory that, you know, there's a limiter on your brain, on human brains, that you can't really remember the highs and lows, mm. you know, I really, I think that's true, you know, uh, you know, you remember them, you know, intellectually, but you don't really remember what it feels like. Yeah. Yeah. Or else you go around crying all the time or, uh, you know, wanting to have sex all the time, you know, you know, one or the other, you know. Uh, so, I, and, I, and I think walking onto a stage is, that, is, is, is part of that, you know, because every time you walk on stage, it feels new. It's, it's new again. First time. You know? mm. yeah, yeah, because you don't really remember it. You know what I mean? You, you, you remember, you know, yes, people are going to be applauding. They're going to be screaming. It's going to be exciting. You can say that. You can say those words. And intellectually, you understand that, but you don't really remember it, you know, until you walk on stage. Oh, and that's, then, that's oh. inspiring to me. That's yeah. really inspiring. You know, yeah. um, you, listen, you're part of the greatest American live band ever. Uh, you were part of the greatest television show of all time. And that's not just my opinion. That That's, that's everybody knows that. <laughs> Uh, you were part of the very, very first Netflix exclusive series, Lola Hammer, which was fantastic. You produced on Broadway. I mean, you started a new radio format, as I said, and now you got the Rock and Roll Book of the Year. And I just can't wait to see what you do next, my pal. I'm excited for you. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Whatever it is, it'll not be what I'm planning. I don't <laughs> plan. I know. <laughs> Miami Steve says, don't fucking plan. <laughs> and listen, I've had you in my head lately because I've been trying to get back in shape for my tour. And I see you on Twitter saying, no fucking sugar, no fucking bread. It's tough, no man. Fucking it's tough. sugar, no fucking bread. Little Steve told me. It's not easy, man. It's not easy. I tell you, you know. I tried to get in shape for these previous three years and I didn't make it, you know, and I was just like very, I was very disappointed with myself, but I said, eh, I'm not really going to be the front man. I'm just going to be a presenter, you know, uh -huh. I'm presenting this music, man. You know, I got the greatest band in the world. They're entertaining enough. <laughs> I don't have to be entertaining. I don't have to be a great front man anymore. You know, so, you know, I'll be, I'll be fighting, working my way back, you know, trying to, trying to get a little better every year, but uh, it's, it's hard, man. It's no hard. fucking sugar, no fucking bread. That's the key. Listen, Stevie, nothing but good health for you and your family. Good fortune, great music. I wish you all the best with the book and everything you work on. And I will talk to you very soon. Thanks for being on Tough Cookies, my pal. My pleasure, my friend. Take care of yourself. You.